after decades of pouring money into Africa, only to see that money disappear to corruption and failed projects. We have now finally realized that foreign aid isn't working, and the West have now ended their programs and stopped wasting resources in poor nations. What's that? We haven't. Our foreign aid is at an all-time high? What do you mean it's not that simple? Let me tell you up front, this video will not have any clear answers. Foreign aid is as complex as the world itself. And I will do my absolute best to avoid some poorly supported conclusions. What I will try to do is give you a picture on how the aid flows today. Who are the givers and who are the receivers. Here we will in general look at foreign aid from the West, so we will have a separate part regarding China. Then we will look at a brief history of aid. How did we get to where we are today? We will look into why aid hasn't given us the results we were hoping for, and why aid can even be counteractive in trying to promote development. Then we will look into why aid can work, why there is still reason to believe in it despite failures in the past. And finally we will look into why aid is such a polarizing subject and perhaps make some careful conclusions. Here we can see the foreign aid provided by the members of OECD and a few other observer states within the works of DAC, the Development Assistance Committee. Every marker indicates 100 million US dollars in foreign aid, or ODA, Official Development Assistance, as it is officially called. We mark bilateral support, resources transferred directly to a receiving nation in yellow, and we mark multilateral support resources transferred to an international organization, like for example the UN, and onward to a receiving nation, in pink. For the nations with a smaller sum, the rounding of the numbers can give a slightly unfair picture of the proportions. We also mark nations that gave below 100 million US dollars with a white marker. These numbers are for 2021. We can see that the United States tops ahead of Germany, Japan, the UK and France. In total, over 190 billion US dollars were given in 2021. Now, let us look at these numbers as a percentage of GNI, the gross national income. Now, the United States is ranking much lower, at 0.18%. The highest numbers we find in Luxembourg, Turkey, Norway, Sweden, Germany and Denmark. Now let us look at the other end, at the receiving nations. This is how the global aid was distributed in 2020. Once again, every marker indicates 100 million US dollars. The aid is distributed on more nations here, so no single stack is as big. The largest recipients we find in Syria, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, Afghanistan, Kenya, Congo and Nigeria. Around a third is going to Sub-Saharan Africa. We will come back to this map and look into some of the nations here. But first, let us get an historical perspective on aid. The start of the global aid flow happened at a time where the concept of development, in this regard, was slowly establishing. In the early days, the definition largely came to be synonymous with economic growth. In the 1940s, the international organizations that still today are at the center of this was established. The United Nations, the World Bank, and the International Monetary Fund, IMF. The US launched the first foreign aid project after World War II, the so-called Marshall Plan, to rebuild Europe after the war. While largely seen as successful, the Marshall Plan had advantages that later projects would not have. The European nations were set to rebuild, not build. Institutions were to be re-established, not established and the economic curves were already pointing in the right direction at the start of the project. 
It wasn't until the 1960s that any aid flows of magnitude started reaching the poorer nations of the world. In a Cold War setting, these receiving nations are often referred to as the Third World. In an earlier context, they might be referred to as underdeveloped nations, or the Global South. Here, from now on, I will refer to them as low-income or poorer nations, or just plainly receiving nations. The aid projects of the 1960s were mainly focused on ambitious infrastructure projects. Money from the high-income nations built dams, roads, railroads, airports and power plants, basically everywhere. The word that came to define development here was industrialization. During the 1960s, the World Bank, acting much like a commercial bank, found it hard to justify loans to poorer nations when the risk was considered too high. By the end of the century, the idea of subsidized loans with a lower than market set interest rates and loans spanning over a longer period of time was tried out. This idea would be by the 1970s well established and foreign aid would never look the same again. By the 1970s, there was a breath of liberalization running through many low-income nations. Most had gained independence from their former colonial powers by now, and cooperation between them, without the interference of Western powers, gained some traction. In the West, the concept of basic needs established itself, the idea that the aid would be most efficient when attacking poverty directly, rather than through some form of trickle-down approach. At the same time though, the loaning from the West, mainly through the World Bank, was at an all-time high. From being strict with who could receive a loan, the bank was now lending without any restrictions. Many low-income nations started taking out new loans when they couldn't afford to pay the interest rates of the loans they already had. In many nations, corruption soared. At the same time, economic downturn in the aftermath of the oil crisis resulted in high inflation and rising food and commodity prices globally. By the start of the 1980s, many nations were unable to pay their loans when interest rates had risen. At the same time, neoliberalism had established itself in the West, with Ronald Reagan in the US and Margaret Thatcher in the UK as the brightest shining spokespersons. The IMF launched the Structural Adjustment Facility. Now all nations that needed aid and loans would have to change away from large governments to privatize and lessen public spending. This market approach to development meant that the low and emerging middle-income nations went into economic downturn, and the reforms demanded from the international organizations and the West gave a decade with negative development in many regards. By the end of the 1980s, more money flowed from the poorer nations to the richer nations, when the repaying of loans reached higher and higher levels. In my video on Africa, we could see this development in the negative growth rates that many African nations had between 1980 and 2000. Let us look at why foreign aid from the West to low-income nations worked so poorly. Dambisa Mojo gained a lot of attention when she wrote Dead Aid in 2009. She was by no means alone in criticizing foreign aid at this time, but she became the strongest voice for a drastic change in how the West approached foreign aid. Mojo sees some positive trends emerging in Sub-Saharan Africa in the first decade of the 21st century, but overall paints a grim picture of the region, a continent with the highest levels of poverty in the world, a stagnating life expectancy, high child mortality, plummeting adult literacy rates, high levels of communicable diseases and income inequality. And the main cause of this is, however counterintuitive it might seem, foreign aid. As she writes, more than 2 trillion of US dollars of foreign aid has been transferred from rich countries to poor countries over the past 50 years. Yet regardless of the motivation for aid giving, economic, political or moral, aid has failed to deliver the promise of sustainable economic growth and poverty reduction. Aid is not working. Maybe the number one reason for this is that the money is not going where it was intended to go. The history of aid is filled with corrupt leaders stealing foreign aid money from their populations and depositing it in Swiss bank accounts. This is extra problematic because it makes the corrupt leaders accountable to foreign donors and not to their own population. Why would a leader care to provide education and healthcare if that increase in tax revenue it would generate could just be met with more foreign aid money? Even outside the most blatant examples of this, corruption can eat up foreign aid in the form of bureaucracy 
that leaks money on all levels. By lending money to corrupt nations, aid has helped dictators to stay in power, to build up strong military forces and to undermine development. There are examples of nations not using their aid money for the much needed investments that they are intended for. Or rather, the incentive to use other government resources on projects might be lowered with an influx of aid money. Hence, the aid might not result in as much of an increase in investments as it is intended to result in, if any at all. Instead, the extra resources might be spent on consumption or lowering taxes to gain political advantages. Apart from misuse of aid money, there are other problems to point to. Aid often finances projects until they are finished and not for maintenance. Hence why roads, railroads and power plants slowly crumble over time when financing stop. We have also seen examples of donations being so large that the receiving nations do not have the capacity of handling it efficiently. Like William Easterly points to in The White Man's Burden, the main problem with aid is that it is the ultimate example of policy of what he calls planners. Foreign aid interrupts the free market and undermines its ability to lift the nation up out of poverty. Large flows of aid can raise prices over time and create dependency to the giving nations. There are definitely examples of this happening by will from the West, but it certainly also happens as an unintended consequence. Influx of resources from the outside can undermine local production. For example, how do you keep up a local agriculture industry if you get free food aid delivered? Or how do you produce insecticide-treated bed nets locally when they are shipped in by the tens of thousands? Aid agencies, both private and public, also have the paradox of its ultimate goal being its own uselessness. By the end, the goal of the aid is to no longer need aid agencies. But organizations are rarely very good at making themselves obsolete, and sometimes they artificially extend their so-called raison d'etre. Related to this, aid also creates the so-called Samaritan's dilemma. How can you justify withdrawing help, even if you see mounting evidence of its inefficiency? Much of the aid from the West has been given with many strings attached, with a list of demands for social, political or economic change not the least in more recent years, with demands for democratic institutions. But Mojo argues that it isn't certain democratic reforms are very much needed for the poorest of nations. Instead, a nation can be more efficient in the first few steps of economic development, with a more authoritarian leadership. This of course presumes that the leadership has the for the nation best interest at heart, which is certainly lacking at times. Both Mojo and Easterly, along many other critics of foreign aid, also point to the problem of adopting Western solutions to problems perceived in other nations. Through the IMF and the World Bank, changes in law has been more or less forced upon nations with drastically different judicial backgrounds. Laws that, at best, have been ignored. Alongside many other efforts, foreign aid is often criticized for just being a disguised attempt to ensure dominance and economic profit for the giving nations. This has painted a rather grim image of foreign aid, but in the next part of this video we will talk about why we, despite what has been said in this video, haven't really given foreign aid a chance. Why aid continues to flow, and why aid could be the answer to battling poverty, despite all the failures in the past. Please consider subscribing if you enjoy my content, and leave a like on this video. Thank you so much for watching.